morning good afternoon and good evening as the time zone you are in welcome to second apom school webinar the first we had last month and this apom school webinar has been organized by professor thomas cron and i hope you are able to see my screen so this will be a second apom school webinar and this is a series of apom school webinar from uh, uh, professor thomas prom and his group and this will be on medical physics and advanced cancer services and the first in this series will be physics in external beam radiotherapy there will be four talks the first talk will be given by professor thomas cron and he will talk about introduction outline of the apom school rational of radiotherapy a bit of radio biology and role of medical physicist in cancer management a second talk will be given by jeremy hughes and it will be medical linear accelerators institutional qa and external audit and the third talk will be given by valerie peng and michael gill then and they will be talking on shielding calculations and radiation surveys so first of all let me thank uh, professor thomas cron for taking the pain to uh, organize this uh, second apom school webinar professor thomas cron is very well known to all the participant and audiences still then i would like to introduce him he is the chair of science committee of the apom and also very active founder member of impcb he has more than 30 years in radiotherapy physics and certified as a radiation oncology medical physicist in australia as well as in canada certified for radiation safety in australia he is a director of physical sciences at peter mac melbourne australia previous position related to research new equipment and clinical trials medical physics and radiation protection he has a huge amount of publication and contribution to the scientific more than 300 plus publication articles he is a consultant to iia and other national international organization and as i told chair of the apom science committee with this brief introduction i hand over the floor to thomas cron to start his lecture during this lecture the participant can put their questions in the chat box i will try to collect the questions and put to thomas cron and we can have a lively discussion once thomas cron finishes his talk he will moderate the further uh, the uh, school and introduce the speakers and all with this uh, uh, introduction welcoming you all to this uh, apom school webinar the floor is yours professor thomas cron Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Professor Arun, uh, and welcome everyone uh, to this meeting. Uh, I'm really absolutely delighted and really honoured uh, by AFOM uh, to allow us to present this type of summer school, which I hope uh, you will uh, enjoy as well. It certainly was a, a, a pleasure for me to try and prepare that and try to think about. what could be useful for medical physicists in these times let me share my screen uh and you should by now see a nice purple screen uh of the a from summer school uh and i'll just see if i can put that on full screen here we go uh please interrupt me uh, via chat or uh, any other means at any time 
uh, it is really a bit like school and, and you are encouraged to actually make your presence felt through questions or trying to clarify issues as we move along. What we'd like to do in four sessions, and these will be sort of four webinars uh, as we move uh, throughout the year, uh, is present a single hospital experience uh, in a whole variety of medical physics areas. So what? Uh, be before I start, uh, just uh, a brief introduction of myself, and, and you, you have heard that already, but I, I feel it's probably also important to quickly say something about the institution I'm coming from. Uh, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne uh, is a larger, rather large radiotherapy uh, and cancer treatment and research centre. Uh, we are operating on five campuses, uh, have 16 linear accelerators and offer more or less all uh, radiotherapy services uh, which are uh, available. Uh, we also now have just recently installed a gamma knife uh, and uh, operate a variety of treatment planning systems. What I think is important though, uh, is that we are working in tumor streams. And that basically means that there is a degree of subspecialization amongst all team members, including the medical physicists. So I have been involved particularly in breast uh, cancer and lung cancer, and many of my colleagues have also acquired a bit of specialist knowledge in particular cancers. This does help us to try and link closer to the radiation oncologists and their interests, uh, for example, in these clinical trials. I do appreciate that we are a very fortunate institution overall, uh, being so big, being relatively well equipped uh, and having about 25 medical physics staff. What we'd like to do in this summer school is really not uh, uh, though, uh, talk about the, the cutting edge, but what we'd like to do is really share with you some practical experiences and some practical things which you hopefully find interesting. So it's a bit more a refresher, a bit more like continuing professional development uh, uh, as such and trying to uh, make sure that we are all uh, carrying uh, uh, that the same amount of knowledge. And that's something we would like to do in four school days. And these school days are today uh, the physics of external beam radiotherapy, and that obviously includes also quality assurance. Then uh, the next session will be more about stereotactical high precision therapies, and that is sort of covering our whole stereotactic program from intracranial to uh, uh, extracranial. Uh, uh, stereotactic treatments with all the motion management and all the things uh, you, you may expect in this sort of uh, process. We also will then talk a bit about TBIs and total body electron irradiations uh, and then in the third session uh, talk about imaging and data for therapy and the, the data bit is, is sort of an interesting one. Uh, we are having some research collaboration with uh, colleagues in diagnostics who are looking at artificial intelligence and looking how can we make sense of, of, of all that, that data and then finish off probably by the end of this year or early next year with a session on brachytherapy and open sources. So open sources, these are now called nuclear medicine therapies, uh, is something which is obviously really emerging dramatically from what was uh, just iodine-131 uh, treatments for thyroid cancer to now a whole host of isotopes, mostly centered around lutetium, uh, yttrium, and, and so on, uh, uh, which are used for a variety of uh, cancer treatments. These are single hospital presentations, so they can easily complement e each other, and we can all chip in if you have any questions and answer the questions from different directions. The presenters reflect all staff levels. Uh, we have people uh, uh, there from a more senior level, but also uh, from a more junior perspective, because what we'd like to do is really give you sort of a fresh view of what happens on the shop floor here at, at, at Peter Mack uh, and try to sort of capture experiences and experience levels uh, at all different levels overall. This 
overall concept is a bit of an experiment. So we do rely on your feedback. And if you have any feedback, please in the chat or by another means, which is uh, the fact that this school unfortunately is not hands-on. We would love to, to run schools hands-on, but for a variety of reasons, distance, COVID and so on, uh, this is not possible. So what we do is we've condensed things into 20 minute lectures, uh, followed by a few uh, specific questions which you can pose via chat. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, at the end, there will be time for more questions. And we have also prepared some questions for you because this is after all sort of a schoolish type in environment. And these questions are multiple choice questions. So what we are interested in is to see, is that any use? Do you take anything home from these, these lectures? Or uh, is this just a nice way of spending half a day or a couple of hours there? So what we do is we have put together after each of these uh, four days, uh, questions which look a bit like that question down there on, on the right. And these are typical formats for questions, for example, used by the International Medical Physics Certification Board, used also by the American ABR, used by a number of other certification boards. So they do give you a bit of a feel for what these examinations and certifications are all about. These questions are in these exams typically to be answered in a minute or two. Uh, here, you've got two weeks time. And I was hoping that uh, we distribute to all participants here today, uh, a sheet uh, of, of these questions after the lectures, uh, and then you're uh, uh, asked to fill these in and please send them to me. Uh, we will mark them and people who have uh, 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 completed enough questions uh, successfully uh, will be getting a special certificate. So that's what happens today. Uh, and we are talking medical physics and advanced cancer services. This is the first lecture, which is focused on external beam uh, radiotherapy. The second lecture uh, will then uh, be uh, by uh, Jeremy Hughes from our institution. And uh, Jeremy is a clinical medical physicist working in one of our campuses in Imurabin. Then uh, Valerie Peng, uh, who is a, a medical physics senior trainee, uh, and uh, she is in our Bendigo campus, uh, and will talk a bit about shielding calculations and surveys, and is supported uh, by Michael Geelan, who is our radiation safety officer, uh, uh, who will talk a bit more about the whole framework of radiation protection and specifically talk a bit about, about surveys overall. So what we have here is really a group of people from three different sites, but all part of the same hospital group uh, as, as such. So sharing the same experience, sharing the same documentation, and hopefully sort of sharing the, the same approach to patient and cancer treatments. And, and then we will have questions and hopefully answers. So if there aren't any uh, interruptions or any questions right now, I might kick off uh, with the first presentation, uh, which is going a bit back to radiobiology. So I'd like to cover a bit of the objectives of radiotherapy, then talk a bit about radiobiology and the role of medical physicists in all this overall complex of cancer uh, treatment and advanced cancer treatments. I'm also conscious of the fact that I probably only want to spend 15 minutes on that, so we have plenty of time for discussions. As a physicist, the aim of radiotherapy is simple. It really looks like that. As a physicist, we abstract things and build models so the patient can be a square, the target can be a circle, and the critical organs can be all sorts of rectangular shapes. So all we come down to is a geometric problem a geometric problem which tries to deliver as much radiation dose to the target as we can by trying to avoid these critical structures. Very, very simple aim of radiotherapy. If we go a bit further, uh, then we can sort of be a bit more specific and look at the target for radiation, uh, which is probably the DNA as the most important target. I should point out, it's not the only target, but for all intents and purposes, if one were to be asked in an exam, what's the target for radiation? Well, it's the DNA. And why is it the DNA? Well, the DNA is such an important uh, 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 molecule. 
It's also a rather big molecule. And if you think about uh, the room you're currently in, if you just sort of look around uh, your room and you sort of think, oh, well, it's about maybe 10 meters wide, 10 meters, uh, uh, then this is about the size of the DNA in that room. So the DNA is actually rather large. It's a lot of stuff there. And the DNA is about two meters long, all come together in a tiny, tiny, tiny little ball of about one micron in, in size, in about 10 micron cell uh, uh, on overall. And very importantly, there's only one of these things there. And the DNA is very, very important for many things, for passing on information to daughter cells, uh, but also it's sort of the cookbook, the recipe book, where you uh, go to if you need a certain protein. If you look up in your DNA, that's the protein you want. You transcribe that uh, and build these in cells. So we are in trouble if radiation heals that, that cell. And that's really what radiotherapy is all about. And this is what radiobiology is really all about. Because one gray and one gray compared to environmental radiation is about a thousand times higher than the environmental radiation you get in a month or so. Uh, one gray, though is in radiotherapy quite common, uh, produces per cell about thousand single strand breaks, 40 double strand breaks, lots of base alterations. All that stuff in that wool ball is going wrong. However, if you actually look at the fact that two gray, that's twice that sort of uh, uh, damage, kills only about half of all cells in an ensemble, which means that the other half must have effectively repaired uh, all the, these lesions. So there are very, very effective repair mechanisms in place which protect the cells uh, from that radiation damage. If you look at that two gray per fraction, uh, which kills about half of the cells, we can very easily picture radiation biology in radiation oncology. This here is a picture of the, of, uh, the, the cells here uh, on, on, on the right. And it typically the clinically observable phase sees a tumor of about one gram. That's sort of about a, a tumor in the breast tissue, which can be just palpated. Well, one kilogram uh, is probably sort of the largest lump you may find in the lung. Uh, as a lung cancer before it becomes so symptomatic that you have to do something about it. But if you think of one gram as tiny small, a small cancer which has just been picked up by an x-ray, by a mammogram or by palpation, uh, then we have about 10 billion, uh, about 1 billion cells, 10 to the 9 cells. Now just to do the maths, 2 gray kill half of the cells. So what we actually have then is these two gray fractions, each of them kills about half of these cells. And you can very easily then look at two to the power of 10, gives you about 1,000 uh, times cell kill, 1,024. So three times 10, 1,000 gives uh, 1 billion, or basically we need 30 of these fractions to get down to one or hopefully below, so we don't have any uh, uh, residual tumor cells left there. How many fractions do we give in radiotherapy? Well, for curative intent, we do give sort of uh, 30, 35 fractions. So this all makes absolutely perfect sense in terms of the numbers. However, the tumor is obviously not stay, stable there. It will, in that time, repopulate. It will continue to grow and tries to tip that balance of radiation against the cell kill we are inflicting with radiation. That's probably a good time to introduce you uh, to something which you probably have heard about, the four hours of radiotherapy, uh, which is a concept introduced by Rod Withers nearly 30 years ago. And the four hours are reoxygenation, redistribution, repair, and repopulation. And these are all important concepts in the context of radiobiology. Let's look at repopulation first, because that's what we've seen on the previous slide. And this is basically sort of a very simplified picture of radiation and tumor growth. This is the tumor size here, and the tumor grows as it goes along. 
if I irradiate the tumor here at, at this point in time with uh, radiation, then the growth will be delayed and actually cells die uh, overall. There will be a bit of residual growth because the cell kill often only occurs after a couple of cell divisions, up to five cell divisions. So there is a bit of residual growth, but then the cells get a dye and are eaten up by macrophages and uh, uh, getting out. If the radiation dose was not high enough though, then the tumor starts growing again and uh, we have the same problem as we had before. What we want to do obviously is give enough radiation to actually get that tumor down to its knees and uh, uh, be off the charts overall. So probably a single fraction is not sufficient and we need to continue this over and over again until we get down to single cells of ease. So repopulation basically means cells grow during radiotherapy and for tumor cells this repopulation counteracts the cell killing. The potentially doubling time of tumors uh, can be as short as two days. That basically means if you have a, just a small tumor which is well oxygenated, well in, uh, uh, in nutrition, then it can grow very, very, very fast. Every two days it grows, it doubles, which basically means it takes away one gray worth of cell killing when you, uh, uh, for every day. So basically, if at the end of a course of head and neck cancer radiotherapy, I introduce a weekend, two days break for the patients, we basically waste one fraction of two gray as we wait for the tumor to repopulate. Not really good. Reoxygenation is another important concept and, and that basically comes to the foreplay, for the foreground uh, when we think about the different ways how radiation interacts with the DNA. First, we've got indirect action and the direct action where the radiation directly hits the DNA is probably not affected by oxygen. But a lot more with low LET radiation uh, is actually done by indirect action where we do uh, create radicals and oxygen is a very important promoter of these radicals. So in the presence of oxygen, we generate radicals. These radicals can diffuse a bit around uh, in a much larger la radius than the DNA itself and attack the DNA overall uh, and again, cause damage. So if I take oxygen away, I will reduce this part of the indirect action uh, uh, here and therefore reduce the effectiveness of radiation. We over, often overcome that by giving a bit of radiation to start with. That means the, the tumor uh, uh, starts to we kill some of the cells out of there, the blood vessels open again and we start reoxygenating the, the tumor. Then we've got redistribution. Don't want to spend much time here uh, uh, to just, just illustrate that in different phases of the cell cycle, because that's what cells do in particular, if they rapidly proliferate, they do uh, 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 go through the cell cycle uh, and in different phases of the cell cycle, different repair mechanisms happen, different ways of cell kill happen, and we do get different radiation sensitivities. We also have here these cell cycle checkpoints, uh, which are really quite important and open a whole new discussion. We could spend half an hour on talking about these checkpoints because they're really quite important. They mean that cell is clever enough to say, oh, I hit stop. I'm not going to, to uh, continue anymore with my cell division. I first need to do either repair or for the sake of the common good, uh, uh, do suicide. And, and this is something which is mediated by these cell, uh, cell uh, uh, checkpoints. Uh, some of these checkpoints are uh, not present in tumor cells, so that gives us radiologically an opportunity to interact with these cells. Sorry, and finally, Thomas, um, I'm, we're getting quite a bit of feedback on your end from the microphone. Um, All right. Good, I'll, I'll do that. Is that better? Still quite here, I'm not sure where it's coming from. Uh, how is that? No, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I will try with that. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the, the final part is, is the repair, repair part. 
school uh, where the final R is, is, is there, and uh, all cells repair radiation damage. We have already really talked about that a bit, uh, and uh, that rep uh, repair uh, is something which is in response not just to radiation damage, but to a whole variety of different damage uh, types uh, uh, overall. It can be temperature, uh, chemicals, and the uh, uh, damage to cells from other uh, toxic agents is about 5,000 times higher than uh, radiation. The repair half-lives so are of the order of minutes to hours. And that is now important because if I look at radiation in the biology, uh, radiation biology in the timeline thereof, uh, then uh, we can, in this chart here, this is a logarithmic scale, uh, which goes from the time it takes to break a chemical bond uh, to the lifespan of, of humans. Uh, we can look at all the different time scales there and in radiotherapy, we have tools, we have opportunities to actually change the uh, 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 or influence what happens there by changing time between fractions, time of the fractions, use pulsed radiation, and so on. So these four hours of radiotherapy have different uh, requirements for radiotherapy, minimum overall treatment time, maximum overall treatment time, and so on. It's important to note that we cannot achieve the optimum in all of these uh, uh, overall for all circumstances, and it is important for the physicist to really understand how do we address this, because in the end, the role of the physicist is to use models, mathematical models, to make radiobiological reasoning useful in clinical practice. And there are a variety of models uh, there, which will be covered in another AFOMP summer school. So coming back to the uh, aim of, of radiotherapy, uh, this becomes then a geometric problem, a geometric and a time problem. A geometric problem is obviously really well suited for uh, uh, physics uh, uh, approaches uh, uh, overall. But in order to understand the geometry, we have to counteract one particular problem. And that problem is that uh, cancer cells derive from normal cells. They are basically mutated normal cells. Therefore, they are difficult to see, both for diagnosis and staging, for target delineation and for treatment delivery. And image guidance and advanced imaging tools are really important to help us with that task of the uh, radiotherapy uh, 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 objective, which is really about local control. And the local control then breaks down into the identification of the target, the delivery of, of radiation uh, there, and the delivery of radiation uh, is then breaking down again into the distribution of the dose, which is basically what we've talked about in terms of the geometry process, and the accurate uh, uh, delivery uh, overall, which is basically the image guidance. So basically, imaging, high quality imaging, good interpretation of imaging is cutting through that fog on the previous slide and identifies the target and at the same time identifies it over and over and over again during the treatment delivery. This is something which also is then apparent in the patient pathway, and we'll talk a bit more about that in the next lecture uh, of, of JLE, where the quality assurance activities are linked to these different tasks overall. Physics involvement is really tremendously important there because these patient pathways are linked to technologies and techniques uh, uh, overall. And I've just sort of listed here all the different bits and pieces where physicists are involved in our clinic in this patient pathway. So I think we do as physicists need to really take that responsibility and accept that we are part of that clinical team uh, overall. And that is really sort of shown in the evolution of radiotherapy, uh, which really has gone from fixed uh, field treatments to isocentric conformal radiotherapy. And wherever you are on this scale here, from the isocentric treatments to IMRT, IGRT, or stereotactic treatments, wherever your clinic are, it doesn't really matter. 
you are on that pathway of increasing and improving dose distribution. And you are on that pathway of reducing margins and therefore sparing normal structures better. And you are on that pathway of introducing really more and more computer tools into the clinic. That basically means that, well, higher dose, tighter margins, more computing, physics becomes even more and more and more part of the uh, treatment chain for patients. So in summary, really, uh, I was trying to illustrate the objective of radiotherapy, which is to get dose to the tumor without damaging the rest. Summarize a few basics of radiobiology, and I tried to center that around the uh, four hours of, of radiotherapy, and then explore the role of medical physicists throughout that whole process. These are the take-home messages. Uh, there is now a short break as we move over to, to Jeremy. Uh, and uh, if you just take from that, that that lecture these three things, which are really great to, to throw at people in a, a radiotherapy clinic, two gray kill about half of the cells, therefore we need 30 to 35 fractions. Repopulation is with about one grain worth of cell killing at least in the neck and cervical cancer. Uh, uh, overall, so any weekend or any long breaks uh, we give patients are really detrimental. And then the half time of repair is of the order of minutes to hours, which basically means between fractions we should give at least five, six hours of time so normal tissues can uh, repair all the damage. That's really all I have to say. And uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas Kron, for the excellent talk on basic radiobiology and factors of four hours and other things. Uh, I think there are no questions yet. We have received it, but as we proceed, we may receive the questions. And once we receive the questions, uh, we can uh, have a discussion at the end also. So I will request you to continue to moderate now and introduce the next speaker and continue with uh, the deliberations. So again, I am uh, giving back you the floor to introduce the speaker and continue with these things. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope uh, that we have addressed the noise and the feedback at least a bit. Uh, I have to apologize uh, if that was a, was a major problem. Uh, and thank you very much for everyone to, to speak up about it. It's just about everyone needing to, to mute themselves, uh, including myself if I'm not talking. So thank, thank you everyone for your attention. The next speaker is Jeremy Hughes. Uh, Jeremy is a clinical physicist uh, and he will talk about uh, linear accelerators and quality assurance uh, thereof. So that's really medical physics heartland. Lovely, thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas, for that introduction. Um, I'll just get my slides up. Hopefully you can hear and see me all well. Lovely. Um, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm just uh, going to Jeremy, talk. you are not audible. It's oh, no. Really? Either you use the microphone Audibility is very less. Even Thomas' voice was a little bit uh, getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Is yeah, can you loud and clear? Am I just faint? You're loud and clear to me, Jeremy. Okay. All right. I'm going to charge on, uh, assuming that everyone can hear me. Um, oh, but I've got to share my slides again. Sorry. Right. Yeah, it's fine now. It's good. Okay. Lovely. So, um, yeah, so I'm, my name is Jeremy Hughes. I'm a medical physicist down at the Moravin Center uh, of Peter Mac. Um, and today I'll just be talking about medical linear accelerators or Linux uh, and more so, I guess, what we, uh, the quality assurance that we perform on them uh, to make sure that they're all running safely um, 
as well as briefly touching on external audits and how they can help uh, in the in the center. Uh, so yeah, so just basically very brief overview, baseline tolerance values, quality assurance, et cetera. Um, I touched on all of those. So uh, like Thomas uh, just said before, we ideally want to deliver radiation uh, to the um, target, to the cancer targets while sparing all the uh, normal organs. And the workhorse of our departments that do this are our linear accelerators uh, over here. And they, um, they basically shoot radiation uh, down into the patient, into specified locations um, in order to treat the cancer. Uh, now, these are very complex machines. Um, so the goal of a QA program uh, that we are doing on this LINAC is to make sure that this machine is, uh, it hasn't changed from when we took baseline values during the acceptance of the machine. So when we first got the machine in, we um, did all of our acceptance and our commissioning of the machine to make sure that it was nice and safe. Uh, and we recorded all of these baseline values. Uh, and using these baseline values, uh, we've created models that characterize the machine. And then using those models, we can create plans to treat patients. So it's important that the baseline, uh, that the machine characterization and that the machine is performing uh, very similar to how it was performing when we first got it. So we do this by, uh, by um, checking on it um, quite often, sorry, my dogs, uh, checking on it quite often to make sure that all these values are uh, close to baseline values to make sure that the machine is safe. Uh, so we do this through routine quality assurance. It's our bread and butter, uh, well, my bread and butter. Um, so the linear accelerator has heaps of different parts and components associated with it. And so there's heaps and heaps of different things to check. So just for example, just looking at this, we've got your imaging panels, your MBKV, uh, checking to make sure that the imaging quality is nice on those. Um, checking to make sure that your couch movements is accurate for your IGRT, uh, making sure that your MLCs are moving correctly, your jaws, your light field, your gadget rotation, your collimator rotation, there's heaps and heaps of different components. And I'm not going to go into every single one of them because we're going to be here for a very long time. Um, but just know that uh, there is a lot of different uh, varied um, quality assurance uh, checks that we perform on our machines. Um, broadly speaking, we can split all of these tests into four main categories. So the first one is your mechanical movements. So that's looking at, for example, the Linux rotates around the patient um, and also it has like jaw movements inside uh, that help shape the beam. And that's basically checking to make sure that the machine is moving uh, to where we want them to move to. So when you say you want your gantry to move to gantry rotation 90, it actually does move to gantry rotation 90. The second broadly uh, category of test is your dosimetry. So that's characterizing your beam model. Uh, so that is your output of the machine. So when you tell it to deliver, for example, one gray of dose, it actually is delivering one gray of dose and not one and a half gray of dose. Uh, it's also checking the flatness and the symmetry of the beam. So your beam profile. Uh, so uh, yeah, so those are what are used to characterize the beam for your treatment planning system. Uh, you've also got your um, added on uh, imaging uh, quality assurance that you're performing. Um, so that's assessing your image quality uh, and more broadly, I guess, the imaging dose, um, but also your positioning system of your um, image guided radiotherapy. If you are 
uh, using that, it, it's very important to make sure that that is uh, positioning the patient correctly. And lastly, of course, safety checks. So just making sure that all of these checks in place uh, that stop the machine when it should be stopped uh, are actually working. Um, so when we perform routine QA, uh, this is just a, uh, a few pictures of our monthly dosimetry checks. Uh, so very basically, we deliver with reference conditions a known amount of radiation onto our chamber uh, down here. And that uh, reading, the response that we get from that chamber uh, is related to the output of the machine. So that's how we're measuring it. So we do our measurement. Uh, we're measuring the output of the machine uh, to make sure that it's delivering the correct amount. Uh, and we uh, get a number. Let's just say 99. So this is a nice linear scale. Uh, you've got output uh, of centigrade per mu. So you're measuring 99. Uh, and I guess the big question is, well, is that good? Is this an acceptable number? This is why you need your baseline. So your baseline value, the one that you got to uh, reference uh, and you set up your machine to, uh, you've selected uh, and you know that that's 100. So on top of that, you know what number you're aiming to, but you also need to know, I guess, the acceptable range that you can be from differing from it. And these are your tolerance values. So let's say that we take a tolerance value of 3% difference from your baseline, which means that any measured value between 97 and 103, 3% either side, uh, is fine and is acceptable. Uh, so if you were to read some of those numbers, uh, that's good. If you were to get a number that was outside of that, this is what we call, it's a out of tolerance and um, action has to be taken. This machine is not clinically safe anymore to treat the patients. And basically uh, you would place restrictions upon the machines until this issue is fixed. Um, there's another level, another um, action point um, that's just within the tolerance value, or the tolerance level, sorry. Um, and this is basically a warning level. It, it warns you that it is slowly creeping up towards the tolerance value. And if you do receive a reading inside of these warning levels, um, it's still clinically safe to treat, but you should, when it's next, uh, clinically uh, convenient for you, um, you should bring that back into baseline reference values. Um, yeah, that's just summarizing that. Um, so there's a wide, wide variety of tests. I guess the big question is, how did we come up with these? How did we choose the baselines and the tolerance values? Uh, so historically, there've been a few reports TG40 and TG142 um, basically um, prescribe all of these tests. They say you have to test the outputs and this is the tolerance value associated with that. More recently, there's been TG100, which is a different um, uh, document, I guess, um, that uh, gives the control back to the physicists. And I'll, I'll speak more on that later. So very quickly, TG142 looks very similar to this. It's prescriptive. It tells you how often you should perform the test, daily, monthly, or annual. Uh, and it tells you your tolerance values based on what your machine can do. So if your machine is performing more precise uh, techniques, uh, your tolerance values are going to be uh, tighter, uh, which means that your machine has to be closer to those baseline values. Um, yeah, uh, TG100, this is a lot of words, I recognize that, but I'll uh, gloss over. TG100 basically uh, recognizes that each radiotherapy center is different. They all have their different processes. And because of that, 
they all have their different risks associated with them. Um, so, and on top of that, uh, radiotherapy in itself is a, a rapidly advancing field. Uh, so that when new techniques come in, for example, you need to be able to perform quality assurance on those. But if you're using TG142, it might not take those new techniques into account. So this uh, TG100 um, basically gives the physicist tools to assess the risks of your radiotherapy department. And from there, uh, create your own um, a QA program and associated tolerances and frequencies. Um, uh, very, very basically, TG100, uh, what you have to do is you map out your entire process of the patient journey. Uh, so say, for example, um, the patient is being uh, image algo for linear accelerator. Um, sorry. So you map out every single process of what you're doing to the patient. Uh, then from there, for every single process, you ask what can go wrong, how likely is it that it will go wrong, and what will happen if it does go wrong. And this gives you a good idea of, I guess, the, uh, the risk associated if this were to fail. Um, and then according to DG100, uh, you assign these three different parameters, uh, O, which is the occurrence, uh, that is the likelihood that this failure exists. So how likely is it that it's going to fail? Uh, how stable is it? Um, S, the severity, um, which is how bad is it if the failure is not detected or corrected? And D is detectability. So the likelihood that the failure will not be detected uh, in time to prevent an attack, an event. Um, so by multiplying all of these uh, values together, uh, and there's like a guide on how to assign it, uh, assign a value, sorry, um, you get a good idea of your risk if this were to fail and your QA program should reflect that. Um, very briefly, when we are performing routine QA, uh, it's important to know that you can perform them with differing frequencies. Um, so we perform a lot of them daily, we perform some of them monthly, and some of them annually. And a general rule of thumb is that the less frequent your checks are, the more accurate they are, but the more difficult they are to perform. So your daily checks are going to be quite easy to perform, uh, just because you are doing it uh, daily. Um, so this is just a snapshot of our QA that we're performing. So we record all of our information in a database, uh, which is very good because it makes it easy to see trends over time, makes it easy for us to keep on top of everything, makes it easy for us to keep track of all our different machines. It's great. Um, so this is uh, our uh, center down in Morabin. Uh, with our four different uh, linear accelerators. And then if we click on um, one of them, it'll give you all the QA uh, that we need to perform uh, for monthly, uh, basically. And let's just stick to outputs at the moment because it's quite uh, simple, uh, but there are quite a few. Uh, so then it'll basically, uh, yeah, it's quite nice because it tells you the output of the machine, it calculates it, it calculates how far it is outside of tolerance values, uh, sorry, how far it differs from baseline and if it's within tolerance or not. Um, so we also perform dosimetry on a daily basis. So this uh, setup, uh, sorry, so this is um, set up, maintained, and reviewed by physics, uh, but it's performed daily by the therapists on treatment. So using the machines and warming up the machines every day. Uh, but if any issues arise, if it falls out of tolerance or warning, the RTs then inform us and we investigate. And it's very simple. You place it on the couch at a known distance and you deliver the same beams to it every day. And it outputs a nice uh, constancy check. Um, our monthly QA, uh, I've touched on this before, 
uh, is more accurate, has a more difficult setup, uh, and um, is performed by us. Uh, as a part of our monthly QA, uh, checking the output of the machine, we also check that the daily QA is giving similar results to the monthly test, because ideally they should be giving the same answers. There's no point in performing the QA daily if it's giving you a number, but it's not accurate. So that's a very important step in that. Um, apart from daily, monthly, and annual checks, uh, we also sometimes perform these day of checks. So very briefly, uh, SRS is like a technique which delivers a large amount of dose to the brain in a small fraction. So you're getting eight gray in one fraction, which is quite a lot of dose. Uh, because of that localization of where the patient is positioned is very important. Um, so if there is an SRS patient on treatment, we need to perform a day of uh, QA before that patient goes on treatment uh, to verify our positioning system is working as it should. Um, and uh, yeah, so we do this every day, basically. Um, I'm just cognizant of time, that's all. Uh, it, this is basically called a Winston Lutz test. And very basically, uh, you set up your, your cube to a uh, KV isocenter, and then you check it against uh, uh, MV isocenter, which is your treatment beam, and they should agree. If they don't, then your imaging system uh, isocenter coincidence is off. So you'll be moving them to a different location than when you're treating them. Um, don't worry about that. Another, uh, another time that we're performing our quality assurance tests is after a machine breakdown. Uh, so the machine has its own interlocks in place, uh, running in the back end, checking that it is, I guess, within tolerance. Um, so it has an internal device in the treatment head that may say that the treatment beam is not symmetric. So we would then verify this with our own equipment. And so we would place this down. This is called an IC profiler. It has uh, heaps of measurement devices along it. So you get like a nice beam profile. Um, so this is, for example, a profile of what you might see when you deliver radiation to this device. Now, ideally, you want this to match your baseline values, which is what you inputted in your treatment planning system and is what you're planning uh, plans for the patients on. Um, we want this beam to be symmetric so that the left-hand side of the beam is equal to the right-hand side of the beam. Um, and you can see in here, the symmetry is sitting at 2%, negative 2%. So it's slightly off center. Um, we want to bring that in to as close as 0% uh, as possible. Um, so working with engineering, uh, they would then steer the beam uh, and then we would uh, verify that with all of our devices uh, to make sure that the treatment beam is safe and clinical uh, for use. So after a, um, a session uh, working on the machine, uh, we would then have to perform our quality assurance uh, to release the machine for clinical use. So basically, saying that the machine is safe uh, to treat patients. Um, yeah, and that's saying the same thing. So external audits, I think, are important because it might pick up systematic issues with your uh, QA program. Uh, so just sticking with outputs again, uh, a good way of thinking about this is if you're measuring outputs with your chamber and your 
equipment uh, and everything, and you're getting values and they're consistent and they're nice, um, but they might be systematically offset. If you have another center come in with their own independent equipment, uh, they can perform their output checks on your machine using their equipment. Uh, just, and it would be ideal if those um, numbers like match each other. So you're measuring that 99 output and they're also measuring that 99 output. It gives you tremendous peace of mind. Um, in Australia, we are very lucky because we have this, this uh, company, uh, government run called the Australian Clinical Dosimetry Service. That's the ACDS. And this service audits every single radiotherapy center in Australia. Um, it has many different types of audits that it performs, but the main ones are your level one and level one B audits. So your level one audit is an output check um, using OSLDs, they mail it out, you deliver it on your machine, you mail it back to them, and then they read it out and they measure it out and then they check what the output is of that against what you say your output is. Um, on top of that, they have this other audit, the level 1B, where they physically come out to your center with their own equipment and they measure the output of the beam. Um, and it's actually, uh, it's a law now, I think, uh, where basically you have to pass the level 1B audit in order to go clinical and treat patients. At the very beginning, you only have to do that once. Sorry, that's confusing. Um, yeah, level two audits are basically a more complex machinery and more complex treatments. And level three is you're doing lots of different uh, patient-like treatments just to verify that your delivery is what you've planned. Um, this is what they kind of look like, which is nice. So this is just the outputs. It tells you that they all agree with each other, which is nice and green and lovely. And it's also nice because it also, uh, they, they give you an idea of where you stand against the other centers. So all of these other black dots are other centers throughout Australia. And these three colored dots are our centers. And it gives you an idea of like, how well you agree with the rest of Australia, which again, it, it, that's good. Um, so in summary, quality assurance checks that the machine is not significantly different to baseline values. And that if me measurements are outside of these tolerance uh, action levels, then the machine has to be adjusted. Um, yeah, and we perform QA based off a program created uh, looking at the risk of different failure modes um, and also to keep the machine safe. And external audits are an amazing way to check uh, everything. Um, yes, that, that, is, uh, that is all for that. I'm happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, that, that was a very nice summary of the overall QA, Linux QA process. And we had a couple of, of questions uh, uh, there. Uh, I, I've answered that one in, already in the, in the chat, uh, but I might ask you a, a, a different one. How frequently uh, do you check beam quality? Yeah, so this again is a... Um, akin to the um so we check it uh we check it technically daily monthly and annual so our daily checks it's only purely because we have this device which is very nice it gives you a um a, a energy check by looking at the flatness and the symmetry of the beam so it's quite a crude measurement um and i wouldn't rely on it but the information is there. So technically that is a sort of a energy check. Um, monthly, what we do 
as a part of our dosimetry QA, uh, we perform our outputs with this block here. And then what we do, we put on five centimeters of solid water on top of that. Uh, and you're looking at the ratio of the values. Uh, so how much that the beam uh, is attenuated by that solid water in that five centimeter block. So that, 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 that's what I would say would be our monthly uh, energy uh, check, which is the best one. And of course, in annual QA, we take beam scans. So we're doing our um, percentage depth thirst curves in the water tank. Um, but yeah, I, I would say um, the daily one doesn't really count, but it is there uh, and it's nice. So I'm not playing other ways. Thank, thank you very much, uh, 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 Jeremy. I've noted a number of other uh, questions. Some, some of them actually really, really go, uh, good and interesting. Uh, however, I, I think in the interest of time, we may move on to the next presentations. And I will pick up on the two uh, questions about TPR 2010 and uh, daily checks for SRS uh, at the end of the, of the uh, uh, session. Uh, so uh, please stay, stay with us. This is also a bit of an encouragement to hang around for another uh, 14 minutes. Uh, so th thank you very much again, Jeremy. We may move on to, to Valerie Peng. Uh, Valerie is working uh, at our uh, Bendigo campus uh, and she is a, a senior registrar in medical physics which basically means that she has been working in medical physics for three uh, uh, years uh, and participated in a, in a bit of a, a training program uh, in that. But as, uh, as part of that training program, probably even more delved into uh, the different aspects uh, of uh, medical physics than many of us uh, more senior people are. Uh, have done. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that she will share some of her experience about shielding calculations and surveys uh, with, with us. Here we are. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks, Thomas. Let me share my... Can you all see that? And is it in full screen? Oh, good, Valerie. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I'll be talking. My talk today about will be about shielding calculations. So, basically, um, the technical parts of NCRP one fifty one, and then the next uh next user Michael will be talking about the covering the shielding parts and uh sorry surveys and regulatory framework. So, just whatever is in NCRP would be. I'll be talking about primary secondary barriers, some considerations and how to do the uh, calcs. So just a brief history, um, recommendations for the protection against uh, radiation exposure have come out over the years. And this, these are also representative of the, the time. Uh, NCRP 151 being the main shooting report that we use today, uh, which includes Recommendations for photons and neutrons, uh, as it's quite common for Linux to go above 10, 10 MB these days. So previously, uh, NCRP 51 had to be used with 49 uh, in such situations when you have uh, neutrons. So, um, so the shielding design goal, um, is expressed in terms of dose equivalent, so in millisieverts per week or per year. Uh, and the purpose of shielding is to achieve the, the specified design goal. And there are different limits for control and uncontrolled areas. Control areas being um, areas that are restricted to staff and where everyone would also have their dose monitored while well, the uncontrolled areas are free access to the public. And the limits are in terms of effective dose. So, um, so for, for photons, this number is one, but for neutrons, um, since the radiation weighting factor is one, 
So once you see that will be equivalent to one gray for four photons. And the NCRP also recommends five millisievert per year for control areas, but one and one millisievert per year for uncontrolled areas. And even though we know that the occupational limit is 20 millisieverts per year, uh, we usually use five for shielding because uh, since we want to consider pregnant staff also will we'll be working in the area. And next we have workload. So the workload is usually specified as those delivered to the ISO center in a week. And it depends on the projected use of each LINAC. So the number of patients, treatment technique, and physics QA. So for machines with um, multi-energies, the highest energy would be used for your shielding requirements. And this is to, to take a conservative approach. Um, so if, however, the workload for the highest energy is very low. So for instance, we have uh, our next go up to 18 MV, but our 18 X energy is, uh, the, the, the workload for the energy is pretty low. We don't, we only use it for co conventional uh, treatments. So in that case, Can you all see this line here? Or is it just me? Anyway, uh, you ignore that. Anyway, don't bother about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't no. sure why it's happening here. Yeah. But, um, so, but yeah, so if we have 18X, then we would, if it, the highest energy is, uh, has a low workload, then we would consider, uh, separately consider the next highest energy with significant workload. So that we, we use the 10, 10X for our calcs. And for IMRT and VMAT type deliveries, an additional IMRT factor is, is included. And this is because for the same amount of dose to the IC center, a significantly greater amount of monitor units will be delivered. So this increases the leakage. So we consider it separately for when we're doing secondary barrel calcs. Um, so this workload will be based on your machine uh, workload like how, you, uh, how, how many patients and physics works. And if you're not able to estimate this number, then NCRP recommends the, that the machine specific workload be cal calculated. But if there's no available data to do that, then a conservative 500 gray, around 500 gray per week can be used. Um, the next factor we have is the use factor. And it's, it's the fraction of time that the gantry is directed at a primary barrier. So it depends on the treatment methods and installation type. So normally, uh, all primary barriers would have a 0.25 use factor. Uh, that's for uh, assuming that the gantry angles are shared evenly for all uh, four cardinal angles. So even so, we usually give the, the floor a use factor of one. So that's the gantry pointing at zero. And there are certain considerations. Uh, if you have techniques that use a particular beam angle more, such as TBI or tangential breast treatments, then those would require the use factor for the barrier uh, that the beam is directed at. So those barriers will have a higher factor if you consider it's being used more. And the next factor is the occupancy factor that's denoted by the letter T. And occupancy is the fraction of working hours in a week that, that a single person uh, occupies an area. So this factor is, is used to reduce the shooting design goal accordingly, uh, depending on how occupied the area is. So NCRP has provided some recommendations so for instance, uh, offices, uh, offices in the console area, they all have a factor of one because the same person would be sitting in an area the entire time. So next we have the shielding and shielding is, is meant to provide a uh, like shield against the radiation. 
So the types of radiation sources we're trying to shield are uh, mainly from showing uh, photons from the target and also photoneutrons, which occur when the primary photons have energies above the neutron binding energy. So for, for most nuclides, this energy is about 8 M MeV, but it only starts to it only really starts to become significant if the energy is more than 10. And these neutrons are a bit complicated because they can go on to give uh, photons as well, generate capture gamma rays. So it's not just for neutrons, it's the neutrons generating photons as well. So for shielding calcs, we have the workload um, as defined before. So the workload is defined at one meter from the target. For most Linux, this number is uh, conveniently one meet, uh, the, at the ISO center, so that's one meter. So the dose to the, the, the area that you want to shield is simply workload divided by the distance square. Um, so you also want to consider the so this is just inverse square, and you also consider the use factor of the area. So to bring this value down to a, a acceptable limit to the protected area, we would add a barrier in, and the barrier would provide atten attenuation with the, trans with the transmission B. So if you have that, what was there before, and then multiplied by the transmission, it should give you your shooting design goal. Um, so then the transmitted dose equivalent becomes less than the shielding design goal. And something to note is that we will take the protected point to be 30 centimeters from the barrier. And this is also like being conservative uh, because no one will be standing right up against the barrier. So for barriers, we have primary barriers and secondary barriers. Um, primary barriers are mainly the wall, ceilings, floor, or any structure that intercepts the direct beam. So then with the general form of the barrier transmission from before, uh, we can calculate the number of TVLs needed and, and then the barrier thickness. So TVL values are energy and material specific and these uh, and then CRP as a table for concrete, lead, and steel, and so also for energy. So the 10 value layer, uh, the first 10 value layer, layer TVL1, and TVL E is the equilibrium TVL, which is used to calculate subsequent TVLs. And this is because in an inhomogeneous broad beam, uh, subsequent TVLs decrease. And we don't want to overestimate the thickness of the barrier because it's expensive uh, to construct. So for primary barriers, we also uh, would calculate the width. The width of the primary barrier use is basically uh, the maximum projected field size. And then you add 30 centimeters on each side. So to get the largest field size, we would take the rotate the collimator to 45. 45 degrees uh, to get the its diagonal. So that will give you the largest fuel size. And most Linux would have a maximum 40 centimeter fuel size. But older Linux would have the primary collimator, just kind of like the primary collimator to a 50 centimeter circle to limit the fuel at the ISO. So then this is just uh, similar triangles to find the length here. And you can find the length here and at 30 on each side. And so that's the primary, primary barrier width. The plane for determining the barrier width is also different depending on if the primary, uh, depending on if the barrier protrudes in or outside the room. So if a barrier is going, uh, protruding into the room, this is the plane that we take to calculate the, the width. If it's protruding outside the room that we use this plane. So I can't explain it as we look at the pictures. And if you have something that's kind of like a composite um, barrier that has lead sandwich in between the concrete, then you would use that plane here. Um, next, secondary barriers we have, um, it's basically everywhere uh, outside the primary beam. 
uh, that the primary beam does not hit. So, and there are multiple sources of radiation that, that will reach the secondary barrier and you want to shield. So this includes radiation scattered by the patient and leakage through the head. Since, and since the energies of this leakage and patient scattered radiation are quite different, but it's obviously a lot uh, disappeared. So that's obviously a lot lower than the primary beam. So um, in NCRP, they, are, they have a different table since the energy is quite different and they are co computed separately. And we use the larger thickness if they differ by one TV health. So this is the two source rule. I think, yeah, two source rule. So if they differ by one TVL, we just use the larger one. But if they differ by less than one TVL, you take the larger thickness and add one HVL. And again, this is just being conservative in your shielding calcs. So that's leakage and that's scatter. So for scattered radiation, the, the transmission uh, transmission B is calculated with a scatter fraction, that's A, and it's no, normalized to a 20 by 20 field. So that's the 400, and then corrected to the area of the field size on the patient. And for leakage, the transmission from leakage has a power as a factor of 10 to the power minus three. And this is assuming that um, the leakage of the primary beam is 0.1% of the primary beam. Leakage is 0.1% of the primary beam. So this uh, is also over and overestimate because we know that for normal Linux these days, it will have a leakage of much less than 0.1%. And these are just the tables in, in NCRP that you can look up to get all these factors. So it's important to note here that leakage and scatter have their own TVL tables since a reduced energy is considered. So this energy is just the energy of the primary beam, but leakage and scatter have their own tables. Um, it's after your primary and secondary bear, we also have maze calcs. Um, the entry to the bunker is usually through a maze entrance and they, uh, there is at least one turn to reduce the radiation level at the entrance. So with each, each hit, the energy of the radiation drops significantly. And you can see in our bunker here, we have two turns to increase the scatter. And these are all just a lot of additional factors that you will look up in the NCRP tables. Um, when you're doing these calcs, so the distance to each point is also important when you're doing these calcs. And so there are four components here, uh, patient scatter, primary scatter, leakage and leakage to the enemy. So that's a direct one out to the door. And we just add up all the components, but for primary scatter, there's an additional factor here, F factor and the factors, I think they're 0.25 to account for patient trans transmission. So usually you have the patient there. So the factor is just to reduce patient uh, primary scatter. So these are just a couple of considerations uh, when doing your calcs. First one is uh, IMRT of the modulated treatments. So in such cases, you would have very small field size and modulation is done by the MLCs in IMRT of the net. So that means a larger um, amount of monitor units is delivered for the same dose compared to conventional treatments. So we would be adding uh, an IMRT factor, which is simply the ratio of MUs for the same dose, uh, IMRT and conventional. So usually during planning, we observe a factor of about three, but we always try to be conservative and use like high value of five when we're doing these shielding calcs. And yeah, it's important to note that uh, our MRT or modulation, it increases the leakage because it's more in use for dose. So it's more leakage even though the primary dose is the same. However, it decreases the patient scatter because the few sizes are smaller. Um, 
that's pleasant AMLC openings. Next, we have uh, TBI. So if a TBI, the patient is treated at an extended SSD. And since the workload is defined at one meter from the source, then the TBI workload is therefore dosed to the patient uh, and then multiplied by the distance squared to bring the dose back to ISO. So that's just in this square, excuse me. Um, this previous thing when we calculate workload, is we can just use those prescribed to the patient because usually a patient would be at ISO. But for TBI, since the patient is further away at an extended SSD, so whatever dose is prescribed uh, would be at that distance. And then you have to calculate the calculate dose back at ISO, which would be much higher. So TBI uh, workload and conventional workloads considered separately and with their respective use factors added. So for instance, if we have um, oops, one TBI patient a week and then 12 grays of prescription and an SSD of four meters, and this 300 gray per week is just your conventional workload, then your TBI workload will be 192 gray. And for the barrier, uh, the use factor for the TBI wall would be one, and for non-TBI, we use it as 0.5. So that's what I mean by using different use factors for the different treatments. So 0.25 for convention and one for TBI. And you just consider them separately to get total workload. And finally, these are just a couple of um, conservative assumptions when we do shielding kelps. So the first is that uh, the primary beam attenuation by the patient is neglected. So we just take whatever is prescribed to the ISO, even though that value will be much less after you consider attenuation of the beam by the patient. And we also consider a perpendicular incidence for maximum barrier transmission, uh, maximum leakage of um, we use a 0.1%. Usually that number is about 0.05% for uh, the next day. And also occupancy and workload, we tend to overestimate the number. And when we calculate, we use a distance of point, uh, 30 centimeters from, from the barrier. And also during the survey, we go up that close to, to do the survey. And safety IMRT factors and also two source rule. That's just adding of um, choosing the larger thickness. And if, it's if it's the difference is less than one TBL, we add a HBL. I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. Uh, I think in the interest of time, and since the next presentation is directly linked uh, to, to this, and, and now looking after the calculations have been done, how this actually is manifesting itself in real life. Uh, I would like to move to the next presentation, uh, which is given by Michael Geelan. Michael uh, is uh, our radiation safety officer for the whole of the hospital. So he comes to, to us with a whole, with a very broad and, and diverse background, including some industry uh, uh, experience in terms of, of radiation safety. So he's taking a slightly different view on, on things and has certainly helped me uh, uh, a lot to understand also what regulators and people who are actually judging what our radiation safety uh, framework is all about, uh, is, is about. So uh, uh, I just, want to hand over to, to Michael for the final presentation on uh, surveys and uh, radiation safety framework. Thanks. Yes, hi everyone. Um, yeah, Michael Gillen, Radiation Safety Officer at Peter Mac. Uh, my screen tells me I'm talking to 137 people from... Sorry, Michael, I can't hear you. How about now? Yeah, yeah, it's audible. Yeah, little louder. Yeah. Can I, I can hear you, Michael. 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to assume the majority of people can hear me. And um, yeah, I was just observing, I'm talking to 137 people uh, from the uh, previous uh, storeroom in my house. So um, strange times. Well, let's get going. So yeah, as Thomas said, I come from a, um, uh, a industrial background and I've been in medicine for about five years. Um, and I'm going to just complement Valerie's presentation and talk about radiation surveys very, very briefly. Um, so a radiation survey is a very important part of the design and function of a hospital or any other premises where you're using ionized radiation. So typically, um, the survey is done at the very end. It's, it's the last step. It's when the, the shielding calculations have been done. They've been um, checked by someone that they might have been approved by a regulator. They've been developed in consultation by architects and builders and your, your brand new um, Linac bunker, or it could even be a, a CT facility, brachytherapy. Um, the survey is often the last thing that you do. So what we're doing is we're taking a measurement. We, we, we wanna make sure this person here, which uh, someone has done a lot of work on and calculating what radiation dose this person is going to get. We're just gonna take some measurements to check that that um, assessment is correct, that the, um, the shielding has got the right amount of radiation attenuation. It can help us check that the builders have done the job properly and, um, and everyone will want to know what these measurements are, or certainly that this wall is, is thick enough um, before we turn the machine on and start work. Now, your methodology is going to be very different. And this uh, is where you need to, um, to sit down and work out exactly what type of radiation source you have and how best to take the measurements from it. So we're all about Linux in during this, um, this session. So when we are doing a radiation survey around a, a linear accelerator, we need to think how are we going to test the effectiveness of the shielding. So as a minimum, we're going to use the maximum um, energy, uh, which is going to give us our, the, the max, maximum penetration. Um, but we, we you know, need to consider that we use a range of energies. So um, we'll take measurements using all clinical beams, uh, photon beams. Um, and then we'll see what else your LINAC can do. Um, if it has triple F beams, we'll take measurements on those. Essentially what we want to do is we want to, we want to max the machine out. We want to get the maximum radiation dose rate we possibly can coming out of this machine. And if our shielding is effective with these properties, then it's safe to assume it's going to be effective for um, your know, lower energies and lower doses, et cetera. But we will, um, if you have the time, um, also measure under those circumstances too. So we'll um, often we'll retract the uh, multi-leaf collimators, we'll retract the jaws, we'll adjust the field size to give us the biggest we can get. And then we'll take our measurements um, from approximately 30 centimetres behind the barrier. Uh, we'll also um, repeat measurements uh, using a phantom, be it uh, you know, um, any phantoms you have in your department or even just some boxes of water will do the job. So here we're, we're trying to uh, simulate the scatter, we'll get up a patient and uh, we'll use a, a scatter object to measure the radiation doses behind our secondary barriers. So, so what are these barriers um, that Valerie and I have been talking to? Well, the primary barrier, this is um, our um, the floor plan of our centre in uh, close to Melbourne city centre. And um, what you can see here is the, the concrete walls and the steel plates. And these locations here are our primary barriers because the radiation beam, um, the gantry can rotate around and the beam is going to hit these walls. So we call these the primary barriers. Bear in mind also that the radiation beam can um, be orientated towards the floor 
and the ceiling. So we also need to consider who is working below this bunker and who is working above this bunker. Our secondary barriers is essentially everywhere else, um, which are going to be exposed by leakage and scattered radiation from our patient or our QA phantoms or any other object, the couch, etc., that happens to be in the way of the beam. So if I was designing a survey around this bunker, I'm certainly going to take the measurement here and here. These are our primary barriers. We want, there might be staff um, setting up a patient for treatment in this room while this uh, patient here is being treated. So we need to make sure that people are safe um, in adjacent bunkers and it could also be a, an office or a storeroom. So we're certainly going to measure on the primary barriers. And then where are, where are our staff going to be? Well, the, the LENAC is controlled from the control room here and um, we'll also be doing some work in here as well. And we might have nurses, we might have physicists passers by in the, um, in the entrance here, and maybe even further out in the corridor here. So you want to select your survey locations based on who am I protecting? I'm protecting people. You're not protecting space, you're protecting people. So you need to look at your floor plan, look at the shape and size of your building, and work out where you need to take measurements to protect your people. Bear in mind as well, depending on where you're, um, whether you've got a, a radiation therapy centre that's um, below ground, like this one here, this um, is, is dirt, this is earth, There's, it's impossible to access this area. So obviously no measurements are required or possible. But lots of radiation therapy centres are uh, above ground, you might have a, a road that goes along here. You might have a garden. You might have a, um, the premises of another institution. So in this case, you would also measure in these locations here. So every different um, centre will have its own different survey requirements depending on the, the geometry of that department. So once you've decided where you're going to take your measurements, you need to actually take the measurements. And this is extremely important. If you're going to um, you know, declare an area, um, let, let people work in there, say this area is, is fine for people to be working in. And I'm happy that the building has been built in accordance with the shielding calculations. You're going to need to take a decent set of measurements. So you need a, an instrument which is fit for purpose. So um, uh, an iron chamber is um, a preferred instrument for measuring around essentially any x-ray source, in, in my opinion. Um, they can differ in terms of their response time, but an iron chamber basically can handle a pulsed beam, uh, which comes out of the linear accelerator. So you need to know your instrument. Um, how it responds, um, will it detect, can it detect an 18 MV uh, photon? It might not. Uh, how fast does it respond to radiation? Um, how sensitive is it? Uh, can you set up the instrument so that you can leave it in a fixed location for three minutes and then take the measurements that way? Uh, is it a requirement that you're instrument is calibrated um, and you know is it generally in in good condition now you know certainly um, if I was doing a survey around a brand new um, Linac in a brand new hospital I would be making sure that my instrument is calibrated and has a traceability in accordance with your um, local regulations and you also need to consider whether you need to take neutron dose rate measurements if you're operating at um, photon beams, essentially greater than, than 10. And the experience I've gained at Peter Mac with uh, 18 MV beams, you can certainly measure neutron dose rates um, just at the maze entrance. If you're, if you're close enough, you can maybe measure a very low dose rate in the control room. Um, but even at 10 MV, 
with a good quality neutron dose instrument, you, you can just about measure um, neutrons. Again, you might not need to, um, but this, these are all things that you need to think about in your planning of your survey. So once you've selected your locations and you're confident that you're using a appropriate instrument and your measurements are going to be reliable and meaningful, um, you, need to, you need to do the survey, of course, and then you need to write it up. This, again, is extremely important, in, in my opinion. Um, you might need to demonstrate to, um, it could be your direct supervisor, it could be the hospital manager, it could be the builder, the architect, it could be your regulator, that you need to show um, evidence that that survey has been conducted and that that facility is safe to proceed. Uh, you might also want to um, do a DOS estimate. So as Valerie described as part of the shielding um, assessment, you essentially predicting what DOS the next uh, a person is going to be, and that's protected by a barrier. So you may want to verify that with a DOS estimate where, and I won't go through this because Valerie's covered it, but um, you can repeat um, the calculations and factor in your radiation dose rate measurements as well. That allows you to answer some very important questions. Is your shield inadequate? Um, hopefully. <laughs> um, I, are any controls required? Um, there are facilities within Peter Mac that although the, uh, the shielding is, is fine, uh, there are some controls in terms of allowing pregnant workers in these areas for a prolonged time. You know, the, um, so even though your shields are uh, great, you might in some circumstances need additional controls. The important thing, however, is write it down and keep it. Um, things change uh, very rapidly. And let's say that uh, your hospital manager says, well, we, we're gonna, increase the energy of a LINAC. So if you've got your old server report, you can use that to see whether that's going to be acceptable in that facility or whether additional shielding is required. The, the room that's adjacent to that bunker, it might have been a storeroom and the hospital says, we're getting busy, we need more offices. We're going to get rid of that storeroom and we're going to turn that room into an office. So you can go to your survey report and then you can go to the hospital management and say, yes, that, that room is uh, acceptable or um, you're going to need additional shielding. So having a radiation survey written down and documented and uh, make sure that you keep it. Um, we have you know, situations here at Peter Mac where the, the only information I've been able to find on how thick is this barrier or what's what's down there was with some radiation survey reports that were done by physicists uh, 20 years before I worked here. Um, the architectural reports were, were long gone, um, but physicists, you know, we like to keep our documentation, we don't destroy records. Um, and it's the same with radiation survey report, they come in extremely useful for all, all manner of uh, purposes. So um, in the interest of time, I might just go swiftly on and I'm, I will hang around at the end of everything to answer any questions. And uh, we've been talking for quite a while now and um, I'm sure you can see the word regulatory framework and it might sound a bit dry. And uh, however, this is extremely important. The work we do with the use of radiation in medicine or, or, or anywhere, um, is governed by the law. And what you do as a physicist or what you don't do as a physicist um, can end you up um, you know, facing the law. Uh, don't want to scare anyone. Uh, I'm sure we all work for very um, well-run places, um, but this is not straightforward. Um, and uh, importantly, you have a general awareness of the regulatory framework. So as I said, the use of radiation medicine, it's, it's legislated. 
and whether that is for use on the patient. So there's regulations about when we direct a radiation beam at a patient or we inject them with a radioactive material, there are laws that govern that practice. There are laws that govern us as workers around the radiation exposure that we receive. And the aim of the legislation is um, has got several aims. And, um, and this is as, as broad as, I, as can be. I'm aware I'm speaking to a very international audience. But from my opinion, the, the aim of leg legislation is we want to protect patients from harm. We're all here um, to bring benefits to patients. And so we need to protect patients from possible harm. We all know that radiation, if used uh, incorrectly, has the potential to cause harm. So we need to minimise the risk of harm to patients as, as far as we can. But at the same time, we want to maximise the benefits because we all know that radiation brings enormous benefits to patients. Uh, Thomas has described how radiation kills tumour cells and the radiation keeps people with cancer alive for longer. And away from radiation therapy, diagnostic imaging um, for all manner of applications. So the use of radiation brings enormous benefits to a patient, to that patient's family, to the, to the local community. So with the use of the safe use of radiation is an enormous benefit to, to mankind. At the same time, however, we do know that it is um, not without risk. And to us as workers, we need to minimise our exposure to radiation as low as it is achievable and certainly to below any regulatory limits. So where do the regulations come from? Well, the use of radiation has been around, uh, well, I should know off the top of my head, but I don't, well, oh, over a hundred years in, in medicine, at least. And, uh, you know, people observed adverse effects with the use of radiation. And what I've shown to you here is the first ever ICRP guidance on radiation protection. What I'm trying to communicate with this slide is that we've known about the, the adverse effects on radiation for a long, long time. And the, the regulatory framework for using radiation is actually pretty mature. We've been refining our um, risk assessments of radiation. We've been continuously evaluating the risks and benefits and the controls over a hundred years. So we have a very mature framework for the safe use of radiation. So ICRP, who I introduced on that slide there, they are an international organization um, based in Canada, I think, uh, with a few officers around the world. Uh, they are an independent uh, group of scientists. Uh, they're a registered charity. And their, their, their mission is essentially is to advance the science of radiation protection for public benefit. And public means, means everyone. They are, they've got numerous um, governance committees but their practical work comes from four main committees. So they have a, a group of people that look at the effects of radiation, radiation dosimetry. Uh, medicine has its own committee because the, the use of radiation medicine is the, the biggest application of radiation in the world. And then finally, we have, um, you know, essentially non-medical applications. So, the committees, um, look, I'm fair to say that, it, it, you know, they're fairly dominated by um, North American and European um, people, but they, they do try and reach out um, across the world as much as possible. And I'm sure um, there's people from your countries that are on ICRP, ICRP committees. I know that uh, Australia has traditionally been fairly well represented in the IC. CRP. So these committees are then kind of broken down.
Uh, Michael, are you still speaking? Oh, that that is unfortunate. I, I think Michael's presentation also has broken down, and it, he appears to be frozen on my. Screen. I think that then. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, yes, come uh, back. Yeah. Let's start again. Uh, let's get back on. So for, and then the ICP they break themselves down into smaller task groups. Very important one, um, task group common service. With the increased use of imaging and radiation therapy, uh, the ICRP has created a task group to look at the specific radiation protection aspects within this, um, this topic. And the deliverable of these task groups is generally to write a document. And this is just a screenshot of uh, the last, the latest from the ICRP. And you can see that they cover a whole range of topics, but so many in, in medicine. As you can see, there's accidents in radiation therapy, pregnancy and medical radiation, protecting your hands, nuclear medicine. Um, you know, and these documents, I find them are very, very readable. Uh, they're designed to be read by um, specialists and regulators. Uh, so I think I think that they're very well written, and they're extremely well uh, researched. Before, so if you need to find out find out or anything with the use of radiation, ICRP has probably got a a, a book about it. Most of these documents as well uh, are generally free as well, just to download from the website. Another important international body is the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, the IAEA, are, um, I think they're a branch of, of the UN. Um, they are a member of the Secu Security Council, that they're very high up in the um, echelons of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And despite having the word atomic energy in their title, they actually do a lot of um, research and work in medicine as well. So they again provide technical advice on safe use of radiation in imaging, in therapy. Uh, again, they published quite regularly in, again, what I think are quite readable documents. And specifically for, for myself, um, there's two very um, appropriate um, documentations, radiation protection for the safety of medical uses of ionizing radiation and occupational radiation protection. So these two documents um, re really describe everything that we should be doing or could be doing with the use of radiation in medicine. However, ICRP and IAEA, they're international advisory bodies. They, um, they are not a regulator. The ICRP won't come to your hospital and say, show us how you comply with this. They have no regulatory role. So what happens is, uh, various scientific groups, um, they review data, they review literature, and they identify issues with the use of radiation. ICRP then also looks at these um, topics as well, and from time to time they make recommendations. A good example is, I think, uh, Five or six years ago, there was concerns about um, the prevalence of cataracts in radiologists. Uh, ICRP looked at the, the epidemiology, looked at the dosimetry, um, looked at the radio sensitivity of the eye and decided that the radiation dose limit needed to come down to protect the, the eyes, uh, specifically of radiologists, but I think it applies to all, all workers. So ICRP makes recommendations and they work very, very closely with 
people like ourselves with national uh, physics groups, with uh, national radiation protection groups, because we're the people on the ground, we're the people who work with the radiologists um, and ICRP will come to us uh, for advice and, uh, and information. IA, IA makes uh, various international safety standards um, as well. But this is the important thing. This is your, your national regulations. So these are the people who have the legal authority to come to your workplace and ask you to show evidence that you're complying with the regulations. Now here in Australia, um, we're regulated on, on a state basis. So in Victoria, in um, Melbourne, where we're here now, we're regulated by the Victorian um, Department of Health. If you go to New South Wales, um, they're regulated by their environment agency. So in your country, you might be regulated by, uh, there might just be one regulator, in Australia, but nine. But um, Victoria regulates Victoria, New South Wales regulates New South Wales. And they're the important people who can come to your workplace and ask for evidence of compliance. Could, uh, about five minutes. Yeah, I'm nearly there. So whatever your regulations um, are in your country, they will reflect the ICRP principles um, of radiation protection being a justification, being one of them, where the use of radiation has to be justified. So the benefit to the patient. And this considers um, the patient's age, the patient's life expectancy, uh, their potential for pregnancy, when we had previous radiation therapy. Once we've decided that our use of radiation is going to bring um, a benefit and that we can, uh, that benefit outweighs the risk, we then need to optimize that use of the radiation. And this is, this is all medical physics. This is what we're doing, is we are maximizing the use of So for therapy, as Thomas described earlier, we want to deliver the dose to a defined target and uh, keep the dose to non-targets below any constraints. And in imaging, we, you know, we want to get the uh, right, uh, an appropriate picture quality so we can see what we think is going on. Um, we don't want to overexpose the patient because you, that just doesn't bring any extra benefit. Um, but we don't want to underexpose the patient, which risks having repeated scans. Um, in terms of workers, uh, optimization includes what's called the Alara principle. So we um, that is as low as reasonably achievable. We can talk about Alara principle for a whole afternoon if you want. Um, for me, it's a little what, bit more practical. It's hazard identification risk assessment, having appropriate controls to limit radiation exposure, and having a system in place where we monitor those, the, effectiveness, the effectiveness of those controls. And then finally, um, your regulations, I dare say, will have um, some a dose limit in them. Very important that a dose limit does not apply to patients undergoing imaging or treatment. Uh, it's just justification that applies to the, the patient. But for workers, um, some may argue that we do get a benefit because we get paid to do our jobs. Um, but we don't benefit really from a, a health perspective. So we are subject to dose limits, um, which uh, eliminate the risk of any uh, tissue effects from radiation and keep our risk from our stochastic risk, risk acceptably low. So in uh, the radiation regulations in uh, Victoria, Australia, which changed a couple of years ago, um, they now directly reflect the latest ICRP recommendations. So uh, the exact wording is 100 millisieverts over a five year period and no more than 50 in a 12 month period. I just, I just like to call it 20 millisieverts a year uh, for the purposes of optimization. Different parts of our body have a different dose equivalent limit. 
as I mentioned, um, 20 million sieverts to the eye over a 12 month period. And our skin and hands and feet being a bit less uh, sensitive, we've got a higher dose limit. And your, your local regulations as well, I expect will have um, a clause that any radiation dose assessments to workers have to be recorded and um, probably stored for a set period of time. Um, 50 years or so um, is uh, fairly typical. So in summary, uh, our surveys are a very important part of the verification of the effectiveness of shielding um, you do need to plan the survey appropriately, uh, select your measurement locations, select your um, beam parameters, use the correct instrument, and write things down. Uh, most national regulations can be traced back to ICRP recommendations, so uh, our regulations will all look differently but um, will all probably reflect ICRP recommendations, the key principles being justification, optimization, and limitation. The, the, uh, your regulations will apply to the treatment of patients and the imaging of patients as well as to staff exposure. And uh, I strongly encourage you to have um, an awareness of what regulations apply in your jurisdiction. So I will uh, leave my presentation there and I'm uh, happy to um, take any questions. And thank you all for listening. Thank, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, we have nearly taken up our two hours worth uh, of uh, uh, summer school. Uh, and uh, we've tried throughout uh, to uh, answer the, the questions. Uh, I would, would like uh, to uh, just uh, answer one additional question. I hope they, there isn't, uh, everyone has access to the chat and can uh, fill, fill that in. Uh, I, I think the last question uh, to the team was uh, really about the same limit values throughout Australia. Michael has just answered that as well. So, so I think we can draw this session to a, to a close. Uh, apologies for any additional questions. You are obviously welcome to answer, to ask them uh, to us out of session. You should have all uh, our email addresses or my contacts are, are widely widely known uh, uh, overall. The final comment I would, would like to, to make is that we are intending to send you uh, a, a one page or two pages of questions as indicated already. Uh, if you have registered for this uh, seminar, we will be able to reach you. Uh, you are encouraged to send that in, in addition to any comments or feedback you may have. Uh, as you've realized, this, uh, this is a somewhat different summer school as previous ones, uh, because we're not covering the cutting edge, but we are trying to be as pragmatic and practical as possible. I hope it was still of some use to, to uh, people. And I'm uh, happy to hand back uh, to uh, our president, Arun, Professor Arun, for a couple of final comments. Uh, thank you, Professor Thomas Cron, for organizing this excellent APOM school webinar, second in the series. And I thank uh, all your teammates, uh, Jeremy, Valerie, and Michael, for giving the excellent talk of uh, all the aspects covering. There are a lot of questions. Thomas has tried to reply through the chat. And I hope uh, everybody has access to that thing. He was very kind enough to uh, completely descriptively nicely. He has uh, in the chat, he has replied. So everybody can read those uh, things. So once again, I thank uh, Thomas Cron, uh, Michael, Valerie, and Jeremy for uh, sparing the time to all the participants. Almost more than 137 participants were there at a given time and attentively listening and putting so many questions. Yes, two hours is a long time to hold on. But AFOM is trying a lot of activities. And next to 
come is our regular monthly webinar and this will be on uh, the 5th of august and it will be on technological advances in intraoperative radiotherapy and this talk will be given by professor jinrong dai from china and dr aikhai ng will be moderating he is from malaysia he will be moderating this talk again the third uh, afom school webinar uh, will be uh, i hope it's uh, visible i don't know is it visible no i'll try to share it again okay i think okay so the third afom webinar uh, afom school webinar will be on 21st of the august 2021 and this will be on precision radiotherapy from biological physical and technical aspects and there are four speakers uh, professor hosain professor parsai professor mohammad professor amin and uh, they will be talking on various aspects of uh, precision radiotherapy including biology physical and technical aspect and that will be the third apom school uh, webinar on 21st of the august as you all know this year's aocmp 2021 will be held during 10 to 12th december in bangladesh and this is in the hybrid mode uh, if you are permitted to participate in person you are welcome if not virtually you uh, can participate already <coughs> the abstract uh, platform is open so please do visit the aocmp 2021 website also visit the afom website lot of information they are there lot of awards afom is trying and the phd award is still open till 25th of the uh, july and there are other awards also so i will request all of you to actively participate in afom activities i thank <coughs> jin shians the chair of the education and training committee for organizing this thing the chai hong professor chai hong who is the prc chair for taking lot of care of all this uh, afom activities rajini verma for taking and communicating with all of you coordinating and the all team of afom excom for organizing afom activities once again thanking professor thomas cron michael valery jeremy for providing your valuable time and yesterday also at evening 11 o'clock uh, you were there for the trial uh, our uh, school this thing so once again thanking you all have a safe time we'll meet on 5th of august for the afom regular monthly webinar and on the 20th august for the afom third school webinar we have already put a program of afom school webinar till november and in this series i am thinking to have in december the second talk from the thomas group in the december so with this word uh, have a nice time thanking you each one of you have a nice time bye 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 thanks everyone bye bye